All right, hello everyone. We are so happy to have you, thousands of you, on this webinar right now. My name is Nicole Lowen Brown. I am an executive speaker coach and a content developer for Duarte. And I'm Doug Neff. I'm the content director and head of our executive speaker coaching team at Duarte. We are so thrilled to have you all here today. We are finding ourselves in unprecedented times, aren't we? And a lot of us find ourselves communicating exclusively at home virtually right now. Whether you are a virtual communication novice or you have been doing this for years, we know that you're gonna find this webinar helpful, not only for our immediate situation right now, but well beyond. We hope it's really positive and impacts your career in a great way. Even before this global health crisis happened, as speaker coaches, we've gotten a lot of questions about virtual communication and we heard you, so we're here to help today. We've gotten questions like, how can I command the room when I'm not in the room? And how do I use my voice and my body to really motivate my audience when I'm not with them in person? We've got answers to that question today and much, much more. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, and uh, now that you're all in the room, uh, you're in a Zoom webinar. And we, as Nicole said, these are unprecedented times. We know that our Zoom servers are doing everything they can to keep up with demand right now, but sometimes they fail. So here's uh, what we have planned. If the Zoom server knocks out, if it kicks Nicole or myself off the webinar, um, know that for the first five minutes, we're gonna be trying to get back on and getting everything set back up where it should be. If that fails for some reason and we're not able to restart the webinar, we're going to go right over to Facebook Live. Uh, in your invite, you had a link also to the Facebook Live page, and we're gonna broadcast directly from Facebook Live. So that's our fail safe. Uh, and should that fail for some reason, maybe <laughs> everything fails on the internet today, then what we will do is wish you all a wonderful Friday. We love you all, and we'll reschedule the webinar for a later date. All right, so virtual empathy. Before we go any further, there's one big thing that we have to agree on together. And that's that whether you're in person or you're virtual, the point of any presentation is to move an audience from point A to point B, from thinking, feeling, believing, behaving one way to thinking, feeling, believing, behaving another way by the end of your presentation. It's to influence them, to make them move by the end of your presentation. If it doesn't matter to you whether your audience changes by the end, then don't use a presentation for that. Send an email, send a text. Those are much better methods of doing that. But if it matters enough to do your hair and put your work clothes on for the day and sit in front of a camera, then that's a presentation. And if your point is to move them, then the delivery of your presentation must be in service of them. They are the most important people in the room, or if there's no room, they're the most important people on the planet to you. Now, originally, we were going to say that businesses are becoming more global, and so virtual communication is becoming more the norm. But as we all know, today, virtual communication is simply communication. But the benefits and ease of having virtual communication, of being able to talk to all your coworkers and an audience of 2,305 from the comfort of your living room, that comes at a price. Empathy is more challenging when you can't read the room because you're not in the room. Empathy is more challenging, but it's not impossible. And uh, empathy is our bread and butter. Empathy is what our company was built on. So today's tips are gonna help you be more empathetic to your virtual audiences. Now we need to define what we mean by virtual communication for the purposes of this webinar, because it can mean a lot of different things. Today, we mean any information presented by phone, audio plus content, and or video plus content for the purpose of motivating an audience to take action. Remember, moving an audience from point A to point B. That's what we mean by virtual communication for today. The fact is practicing for a great big onstage keynote where everyone's gonna be in the audience or a high stakes conference room meeting is different from communicating over the phone and on video conference. And as speaker coaches, Nicole and I treat both of those situations differently. Today, we're gonna to focus on virtual communication. 
All right, so over the last 10 years, many of us have started working and therefore communicating remotely. In fact, there has been a 91% growth rate of remote work in the last decade. And that's according to Flex Jobs and Global Workplace Analytics. But we know that that number has dramatically increased over the last couple of weeks. It is truly incredible how many of us are working remotely right now. And we tend to focus on those high stakes communications. If we have an in-person presentation or a keynote on stage, we tend to even get coaches like Doug and myself to help us work on those. And yet we tend to neglect the type of communication that most of us do most of the time. Those internal one-on-one -on -one phone calls, those small group client meetings over Zoom, we would argue that virtual communication is really important to focus on too, and it deserves our attention. And especially now that it is the only way all of us are able to connect and communicate. So we would right now like to hear from all of you. How do you typically communicate at work? Are you audio only either on the phone or just audio over a software platform? Are you audio plus showing slides and content? Or are you doing like we're doing today, audio plus content plus video? So take a moment and go ahead and respond to that in the chat and let us know. All three, video, <laughs> that's a lot of chat, okay. <laughs> lots and lots, very quickly. there are right. lots of you on here. We have almost 3,000 of you. So it seems like we have a mixed bag. It's really good to hear that a lot of you are using video because we're obviously audience focused here at Duarte, we have huge video proponents. Um, we will cover all of these today, but at Duarte, we are focused on what our audience needs, so it's nice to hear that feedback from all of you. Great. Regardless, uh, and by the way, I can already hear the Zoom lagging a little bit, so uh, we apologize with that. We're going to roll with it as best we can. Regardless of how you tend to communicate in virtual settings, it sounds like there's a mix of all three, you've probably experienced some of the good and some of the bad. And believe me, we have too. We've seen everything there is out there in terms of virtual communication, the good and the bad. And the reasons for some of the worst experiences you've had probably fall into about four categories. And we'd like to cover a little bit in each of those categories today. Uh, the first one will be the importance of technology, good technology and making sure your technology works. The second one, we're gonna deal specifically with your voice since that happens in all three of those different areas. And we happen to have a speech language pathologist with us today, Nicole. She's gonna share some of her expertise about making your voice carry and make an impact. Third, we're gonna talk about what to do with your body. Even when you're just audio, your body matters. And fourth, we're gonna talk about how to build a connection with your audience, even when you're virtual. Obviously, this is a short webinar. I've already seen a lot of folks raise their hands and I'm, uh, we're gonna save Q&A to the very end. So I'm gonna ask you to put your questions in the Q&A. Uh, we have three producers on the line, Emily, Alexa, and Kat, and they're going to do their best to answer questions as they come in. And we'll save some of those open questions for the end. And Nicole and I will answer those live. Uh, we're not gonna be able to, we're not gonna have time to answer live questions during the webinar. And I think that's it. So feel free to submit those questions as we go. If Emily, Alexa, and Kat can answer them, uh, they'll answer them in the window. And if not, uh, Nicole and I will answer them at the end as long as we have time. Let's talk about technology. Since all of our virtual communication relies on technology, we're gonna start here. And the first thing I wanna say is that we all get into a groove with our technology. We tend to communicate the way we always have. For example, at Duarte, we hear all the time from different clients, different companies, oh, my team doesn't use video, or, well, that's not part of our corporate culture to use video. And we're trying to conduct a meeting with them, and none of them will turn on their video window so we can't see them. While Nicole and I know that we won't change corporate culture overnight, we also know that if the point of delivering your presentation is to move your audience, and all of you are saying it with me now, move from point A to point B, then every choice you make along the way about that presentation matters. And that starts with technology. I want to tell you about the results of a study on communication. It showed that rich media, and rich media means video conference, where there's lots more going on, is better when you have something more complicated to communicate. 
On the other hand, lean media like email or messaging, when you just get words, tends to be a poor choice for supporting more complex interactions that virtual team communications require. So I'll, I'll put that in some plain language. If it's complex or if connecting with people matters, rich media is better. If connecting with people doesn't matter or it's not complex information, then lean media is fine. Now, at Duarte, we're big proponents of the camera helping us build a deeper connection with people. So we highly recommend that. Anytime it's a presentation, get folks to use their cameras, especially in these times when we're all virtual. Get out of your, this is how we always do things, or my team doesn't use video bubble, and think about what type of media makes the most sense based on the situation. Aim towards the result you want. And we'll send a link to that study in an email that we send you after the webinar. Next, I will tell you that it's worth it to invest in good technology. A good headset is a great investment. So is a good external camera. And you can achieve both of those without spending too much money. Laptop cameras and mics are pretty good nowadays, but if your presentation matters, you want the best quality you can get. So upgrade them just a little bit. Now, one tip, they need to hear you with high quality. So that microphone is really important, but you don't need to hear them with super high quality. So even cheap earbuds will do, like you see Nicole and I wearing today. We wanna hear what's going on from our producers and if uh, in the Q&A, if we open up audio, we want to hear you. But we don't need super big, you know, audio file headphones in order to do that. A second tip I'll give you is that we trust cords better than we trust Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. So if you can, get a hardwired connection to your internet router. And if you can, put those AirPods away and, and take out a wired connection and you'll be able to trust that one more thing can't go wrong. Uh, a lot of you are wondering, and I haven't looked, but I'm sure putting into the Q&A window, what's the best camera or microphone out there? What should I buy? That's a perfectly fair question. If I was on this webinar, I would want them to tell me so I could go to Amazon and one click it and have them send it to me. Well, the truth is that different solutions perform differently depending on the rest of your setup, depending on what else you have going on in your room. So you're going to need to experiment a little bit. I would suggest upgrading a little bit, trying something that's highly reviewed and seeing how it works for you. Is there anything about that camera or that microphone that gets in the way of moving your audience? Uh, if not, then you're doing pretty well. Try it against your last solution and, and see which is better. And that's how you're gonna get to the best solution for you. Now, once you have your technology in place, you need to check it. So our next tip is to check your tech. Before you start to think about what you're saying or how you're saying it, you need to make sure your technology is working. With virtual communication, if that virtual component breaks down, everything goes away. In a room, if we're on a stage and our slides fail, well, we can you know, pull up our pants and we can get to it and we can move that audience on our own without slides. But if you're communicating virtually, you can't do that. If you're communicating virtually and the technology fails, game over. Now, this is the first thing we do as coaches when we're coaching virtually. And the first thing we tell our clients to do before we start a coaching session or a meeting, please, please, please check your audio, check your video and check your internet connection to make sure they're working. Under normal conditions at Duarte, we have a room set up just for webinars. It's this beautiful studio room. We have some good lighting in there. We have several screens. We have microphones. We have a desk for the producer to sit at. Well, we've had to scramble this week. All of that stuff is in Santa Clara at Duarte and we don't have access to it here. So Nicole and I have been, do been doing run-throughs with our producers, Emily, Alexa, and Kat. We've been testing out different options to find out which sounds the best, which looks the best. And because both Nicole and I are relying on home internet services, we're also doing a lot of praying. <laughs> Remember that whenever you're talking about technology, Murphy's Law applies. If it can fail on you, it probably will. It seems obvious, but we've all been there either on our side or on your side. We've been there when things go down. So give yourself the time, make sure everything is up and running before you start that conversation or that presentation. Your audience will love you for it. Third, I wanna talk about some general microphone manners. Mics were designed, invented to do one thing. They were invented to capture your voice. And yet why is it if we're on a speaker phone or there's a group conference call around a table, so many of us lean in and shout at the microphone in the middle. I don't know why we do that. I sometimes catch myself screaming at the microphone. It's not necessary. And when that happens to me in the other end, I feel like the person is yelling at me. 
the microphone is designed to pick up your voice. Said, having said that, there's also no need to do this to hold your uh, little earbud microphone up to your voice. Not necessary. That technology, uh, the guys at Apple have done a good job. It can hang there and it can pick up your voice with no problem. Holding it, in fact, can be a distraction for your audience. And if you get it near your whiskers, then they hear that too, and that's no fun. Of course, it's always a good idea to ask your audience if they can hear you when you first speak. In a crowd this large, we normally wouldn't do that. Um, but we'll, our producers will be watching comments to see if there are any problems and they'll let us know. Let's, let's have a minute to talk about muting. It's a great idea when you're on a meeting or a presentation to keep your microphone on mute unless it's your turn to speak. And don't forget to unmute when that moment arrives. It's frustrating if you've put a lot of thought into those words you're going to say and you spend 30 seconds making this eloquent argument and then you find out that you were on mute the entire time. Uh, check out the Zoom space bar tip. If you're muted in Zoom and your window is active, your Zoom window is in front, if you hold down the space bar, it'll unmute you until you let go of the space bar and then it'll mute you again. So you can easily just click in, say what you're gonna say and then let go of the space bar. Another tip around the microphone, around audio, around being heard is to get a producer who can tell you if you can't be heard and can answer questions for you or for the audience along the way. We use them every time we do webinars. That's a pro level tip and uh, we wouldn't do a webinar without them. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Alexa. And thanks, Kat. All right. On to you, Nicole. Okay. So we are now going to tackle voice. Once you get all your technology set up and you've got these good microphone tips, it's really important for virtual communication to know how to use your voice. And I should tell you all, I'm a little bit biased on this section because I am a speech and language pathologist. So I happen to think voice is your most important tool. So whether you are on audio or video, your voice is the consistent tool that you have across all communication situations. In fact, sometimes it's the only tool you have. If you're using audio or the phone, it's the only thing you have to connect with people and move them from point A to point B. So it's critical that you use it in a way that engages your audience and demonstrates your authority with the content. So the first thing I want to alert you to is what we call articulation. You've got to articulate. Now, what do I mean by articulation? That simply means using your lips, your tongue, your jaw, your teeth, your articulators in a way that makes it easy for your audience to understand what you're saying. If you've ever been called a mumbler, especially over the phone, this is why you are not articulating. You have to work hard to form the words, open your mouth a little bit wider and round your lips. Think of it as stretching out the words. Now, articulation is in, super important for everybody, but it's really important for folks who speak English as a second language. Americans love accents. We love them. It makes you interesting, unique, a little mysterious. I've seen in the chat, we've got people from all over the world. We are all communicating globally now. So if you speak a different language than your audience, you have to make sure that they can understand every single syllable that you're saying and articulation is the way to do that. It's also really important to articulate when you're communicating multisyllabic words, anything with three or more syllables, words such as technology, management, deliverables. You have to really stretch those out so it doesn't sound muffled, especially over the phone. Now, if you're not sure if you're articulating, a good practice tip is to put a mirror at your desk. If you're not opening your mouth much and you can't really see any movement there, chances are it sounds like mumbling on the other end. But on the other hand, if you're seeing your mouth open, you're seeing your lips and jaw moving, people can probably understand you and it won't come across like you're mumbling. Okay, tip number two for voice is to optimize your tone. Now by tone, we simply mean the quality and the sound of your voice. So Doug loves it when I do this, but a lot of people have what we're calling vocal fry or glottal fry. And it's this kind of held back, lazy, tired sounding voice. It's very unenergetic. And it's really hard for your audience to listen to that for hours every day. Don't do that to your people. You have to breathe from your diaphragm, that major breathing muscle in your torso, project your voice and send it forward. Don't hold it in the back of your throat. Send it outward to your listener, even if they're not in the room. Send it far away to the far corner of your office or, or home office. If you're visual, you can think of your voice going in an arc from your mouth to a spot across the room. That's often pretty helpful. You see it sitting here in the back of your throat. Send it outward. You want to make sure your voice 
sounds full and not shallow. Okay, next tip is to end with a downward inflection. Now, upward inflections, also known as up speak or up talk, they can give the impression that you're rambling, that you're asking a question rather than giving a statement, and that you're not standing behind your own ideas. Upward inflections will rob you of your authority, and we want you to be really strong on your communication virtually. So some people think that this is prevalent in California, that it's prevalent in millennials, that it's prevalent in females, but guess what? I have heard it in all types of speakers, so please be aware of whether or not you're doing this. It tends to happen when your sentences are really long. If you're rambling and saying, and so, and so, and so, chances are it's going up until you finally finish. So one way to avoid this is to use shorter sentences. If I don't have the and comma, I'm likely to end downward. And one other tip I'll give you is to use your hand as a guide. If you realize that you're doing this, there's all kinds of research that says what you do with your body is then mirrored in your voice. So you can think, start in the attic and end in the basement. It's almost impossible to start in the attic and end in the basement. That downward movement of your hand is not congruent with an upward inflection. So definitely try to avoid that up speak. And finally, we want to make sure that we're using vocal variety on virtual communication. The best way to put people to sleep is to sound monotone. We're not all delivering really exciting information and that's okay, but guess what? You still have to engage your audience and make it sound like it's exciting or they will fall asleep on you. We are all competing with everybody's inbox right now. <laughs> so if you're not communicating with punchiness and with energy in your voice, chances are they're not gonna pay attention. You wanna find the most important words in your sentence and really punch them. Now by that, I mean you can change the pitch, you can increase or decrease your volume, you can pause before or after that word to isolate it, but you simply can't sound like this all the time, evenly like this. You have to punch your words and make it sound exciting. Couple tips, I know a lot of you are working from home and your kids are not in school. Guess what? You can practice vocal variety with your children. Kids love voices. They love character related books. If you read kids books to them, that's a great opportunity to practice the voices. We know a lot of kids like it when parents do that. If you don't have kids and you wanna practice vocal variety, try reading newspaper headlines out loud. Pick the most important word in the headline and really punch it, make it stand out. Now, how do you know if you're doing any of this and if you're practicing, if you're doing it right? Well, record yourself. All of these virtual platforms, Zoom included, has a record function and you all have a smartphone. Your smartphone has a voice memo app that will allow you to record your voice. Ask yourself, am I articulating? Do I sound monotone? Am I using an optimal tone for a warmth strength balance? And am I using upward inflections? We want to avoid all of those things. Vocal qualities are all in service of your audience and they all create empathy. They're incredibly important, again, especially when voice is all that you have. So definitely practice this stuff. All right, our third category is our bodies. What do we do with our bodies when we're virtual and especially when we only have our voice? Voice isn't the only important quality that brings empathy to virtual communication. Your body movements count too, for a number of reasons. First, when you're on camera, I'm sitting a lot closer to this camera than I would be to you if we were in a room full of people. So your audience can see a lot more, they're a lot closer to you. That means every movement you make can impact your virtual communication. And a lot of people think that how you move your body doesn't matter if they can't see you, if you're only on audio, because no one can really see what you're doing. It's not true. It still makes a difference. Body movement and posture both count whether you have your camera on or not. Gestures first. When you're not in person, you need to use every tool you have to connect with your audience. Most of us have a couple of these, and these are really helpful in bringing your points home. So on video, many speakers place their hands just down here in their laps or on their keyboard. They're just really a talking head like this. But your hands can be a super effective way to help audiences understand you even better. Now, when I'm on camera like this, I have to hold my hands a little bit higher than I would normally 
because I have this line here and I know exactly where that line is. If I'm making gestures down here, you guys can't really see that. So I wanna be aware at all times of where my box is. And I wanna to try to use gestures in a way that helps bring to life what I'm saying. Uh, the reason that gestures make such an important difference when you're speaking is that they engage the muscles associated with breathing and speaking. So even if you can't see me, as I'm making gestures while I talk, remember how Nicole said to, to punch those words? If I'm making gestures when I'm talking, you can hear that in my voice. People will hear that on the phone too. It'll help me emphasize key words. It'll impact my breathing. It'll encourage me to put pauses in my speaking. All of that makes me a more dynamic speaker and more interesting to listen to. So what about the rest of my body? Everything below here. I am wearing pants today. But what about, what do I do with everything below uh, this line? If I'm on a stage, then the Duarte speaker coaches are gonna work with me to make sure I'm using my entire body and my positioning on the stage purposefully to help enhance my message. If I'm communicating virtually like this though, we can't really use that. I can't walk around in my, my dining room here to impact my message. In that case, your posture is what makes a difference. When I'm seated, no matter how upright my posture, I'm always going to be in danger of scrunching my diaphragm and impacting my breathing. And as you heard Nicole say, breathing is so important. It can impact my vocal quality, which is also so important. So if you can stand up while still having a good eye line with your camera, then do that. Standing desks are great. I've seen a lot of chat in the, the, the chat window here about standing up and that's the best way to present. Absolutely, if you can do that, that's great. Now look at Nicole and I, we're both seated. We decided that this was the best overall arrangement for this webinar. So that means Nicole and I have to work harder to make sure that we can be heard, to make sure that our voices are dynamic. It doesn't mean we can't do it, it just means we have to work harder. Uh, if you do have to sit, make sure that your feet are flat on the floor and make sure that your body is scooted to the front of your chair, not leaning in the back or leaning back like this because all of that is scrunching my diaphragm like that. Now, how about when you have only audio? You're on the phone even. You're carrying around your smartphone like this. You're holding it up to your ear. How many people walk around or pace when you're speaking on the phone? Movement is good. Moving around is good. But make sure that you're not doing that in a way that would affect the microphone. Consider how that might impact your voice. Research shows that what you do with your body is mirrored in your voice. So if you're pacing, you're likely not breathing or pausing the right way. Not only that, but it can affect your proximity to the microphone, which your audience will notice. This thing might be dangling, rubbing up against my whiskers, like I said, or my clothing. People are gonna hear that too. So consider sitting or standing in a way that's more balanced and grounded while you present. Okay, now everything we've shared with you so far today, everything is in service of the audience, the folks on the other end of the camera or the phone. But this section in particular is gonna outline ways to directly make a connection with them, even if you're not there. The first and most obvious way to do that through video is with eye contact. Sorry about that. So the first piece of advice is to turn on your camera. You can't make eye contact unless you can see people. And when it's appropriate, when you don't have 3,000 people, ask your audience to do the same thing, to turn on their cameras. You'll be able to connect with people a lot more if you can see each other. And with 3,000 people in a webinar, uh, Zoom will only show 25 people at a time anyway. So we'd only see the, the first row and we wouldn't be able to make good eye contact. So it's better to just not see folks and trust that they're there. And Nicole and I have to imagine you in our mind's eye. We have to imagine Radio City Music Hall filled with people. Now, how you make eye contact matters too. Remember that the eyes of your audience, it's not me looking around at my audience and scanning my eyes across the row. They're represented by one tiny little circle on your computer. On my computer, it's got a little green light next to it. Now, a big rookie mistake is to be constantly looking down at slides or notes, something like that, or at a window on your screen that has your video in it and thinking that you're making eye contact with people. I learned this doing puppetry. When you're doing puppetry, you have to see what the camera is seeing. So you learn to have you know, your puppet hand up and watching a video so you know 
uh, what the audience is seeing and you can make sure the puppet's eyes are looking into the camera. So what I do is I take that little selfie window that you have in Zoom and I move it all the way up to the top of my screen. I place it right next to that camera lens. So as I'm looking at my camera and making sure I know where the edges of my box are, things like that, I'm looking right at the audience window. And I make sure that I'm doing that throughout the, throughout the presentation. So place that selfie window up to the top of your screen. And remember, especially with a laptop, that you might have to raise it up higher to get yourself framed well. There are really easy ways to do this. A stack of books is an easy solution. But get it up to a level where you're looking straight at it. You're not looking way up. You're not looking way down. I've seen these new laptops that have a camera down at the bottom of the screen, and it's just terrible. It always looks like someone's hunched over and looking down at the camera. That's not a good way to connect with your audience. If you've heard of the rule of thirds for photographers, Nicole's and my eyes are about two thirds up the screen. We're right about at that line. And if you watch news anchors on TV, they're about the same. Our heads should be about this big in the frame and our eyes should be about two thirds of the way up. Our next tip is to give them time to absorb what you're saying. We spend a lot of time on this in our Captivate workshops. It's so important that your audience can absorb and digest your content. Remember, the point is to move them, to change, your, change their minds about something. If they can't absorb and digest your content in time because you're going too fast or because you're saying too many things, then they're not going to change their mind about anything. So you can't speak in long paragraphs. A good overall tip is that short sentences are great. Lots of pauses are great. And this is even more important if you only have audio. Now to you, this will probably feel painfully slow. It'll feel like you're not saying enough, that there's dead air, and that it's too slow. But to your audience, it just feels empathetic and generous. It feels like you're paying attention, that you're caring about them receiving the information. And that's always a good thing. Okay, so the next part is talking about setting communication expectations up front. I've already seen a lot of this kind of banter in the chat today. How do you know when it's your turn to talk if you're in the audience? We hear one of two concerns from virtual presenters. One, I'm hearing crickets and no one's giving me what I need, or the complete opposite, people are interrupting me. Most people, most people, are not being jerks when they go radio silent or interrupt you. They simply don't know when it's their turn to talk. It is hard to tell when it is appropriate to speak up when you're communicating virtually, especially over the phone without those visual cues. So tell them, as the speaker, you need to create communication expectations up front. There are ways to avoid both being interrupted and there's ways to be truly interactive and engaging in a virtual presentation. So let's tackle that first one. If you're hearing crickets, tell them up front, this is going to be a dynamic dialogue. I'm going to invite you and maybe even expect you to participate at any time. If you set that expectation and you're still hearing crickets, well, consider that you need to reach out to them at certain points during your talk track. Ask them questions or invite them to speak. Set those points up ahead of time. It could also be, if you're hearing crickets, that you are putting people to sleep, frankly. So be mindful of those earlier voice tips and even the body tips. How can you get more energy and be more dynamic so that they'll be more likely to stay involved with you? Now on the other end of the spectrum, what if you're getting interrupted? Set those expectations up front. You might say something like, okay, I'm gonna talk for about 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And then I'd love to get your feedback and questions so they know when it's appropriate for them to chime in. But also consider that if you're getting interrupted, you might need to stop talking. <laughs> we at Duarte, we're, we're great communication coaches, but we all do a lot of talk about the speaking part and not enough about the listening part. If you're being interrupted, it is chance is possible that your audience just feels unheard, frankly. And as that feeling builds, they'll be more and more likely to cut you off and interrupt you out of frustration. So how can you involve them? You can ask polls, you can ask them questions like we're doing in the chat. You can invite them to offer their opinions in ways that is not going to interrupt you or throw you off of your track. Either way, if you tell them up front, they will know when it's their turn to communicate and you're likely to get the kind of interaction that you're looking for. All right, thanks, Nicole. 
and let's move into a, a quick recap before we get into our Q&A. Um, we've gotten some messages that the, the speaker view uh, oscillates between Nicole and I and not necessarily when the right person is speaking. Some of you can change that in your view. You can, uh, you can click on who you're watching. Uh, some of you can't. Um, we're gonna do our best to be engaging and dynamic no matter who you're looking at. And the other one will just sit there and look awesome. <laughs> so remember that all of your presentations require an audience first mindset. At Duarte, we call that empathy. But when you're communicating virtually, it's even more critical to be empathetic of your audience. When you don't have that in-person connection, and especially when you don't have the benefit of things like gestures, eye contact, or body language to help convey your message, empathy, just thinking about your audience first, is your best weapon. It's your best tool for connecting with your audience. Remember from our, our presentation today, technology counts. So invest in upgrading your microphone, your camera, some good lighting, and test it. Make sure you test it before your presentation. Number two, your voice is key, especially when that's all you have. Remember to have good, clear voice tone and project it across, across all the interwebs into the ears of your listeners. Three, remember that your body movements matter, even when they can't see you, how you're moving. If, if you guys are looking at Nicole while I'm speaking, I have to do my best to be engaging and make sure that my voice is coming across in a powerful way. And fourth, Connecting with your audience and involving them is critical if you want to transform them, if you want to change them, if you want to move them from point A to point B. If you focus on these four things, these four categories when you're presenting, even virtually, you're going to be able to accomplish a lot as a speaker, even when you're not in the room. And Doug, I'd like to add just in, in the climate of what we're all going through right now, just an extra, an extra point on empathy. We're giving you great tips that are going to hopefully help you in your career right now and beyond. We all need to be really patient with each other. If a kid pops into your window, say hello, be patient. If someone's internet's crashing, be patient. We are all doing the best we can. And I think you know that's a really important thing to keep in mind right now. Um, some people are brand new to virtual communication. They've never done this before. Our teachers are medical professionals in other industries. So I think a, a little bit of empathy in you know, beyond memorizing these tips will really, really go a long way. For sure. Patience and compassion uh, are the words of the day right now. Well, before we move to Q&A, I want to let you know about some exciting opportunities that we're announcing at Duarte today. This is a big day for us. Uh, this week has been, <laughs> we've moved some mountains this week for, <laughs> for you folks, and we want to tell you about some exciting things. All of these are going to be included in a follow-up email where you'll also receive a link to the recording of this webinar. Uh, that you can share with friends or family who might benefit from these tips. So uh, new things to announce. First, you can check out our four self-paced e-courses. We have e-courses at Duarte. They range from 90 minutes to four hours long. They cover topics from story, design, and delivery, and they can help you out in lots of different ways. Those are running already. Those are available today. Number two, as of right now, you can get three new packages of virtual speaker coaching from Duarte. Ooh. That means one-on-one -on -one training for you or your team with a Duarte speaker coach like myself or Nicole. And for your team, you can even buy a bundle of coaching. So folks are getting uh, weekly or, or even daily help and improving their virtual communication skills. These all happen over Zoom. Uh, and we've got an, an awesome process in place to help you grow as a communicator in three different packages. And finally, over this last week, our teams have moved mountains. It's been a beautiful thing, but they have made our in-person workshops available virtually. That means our visual story workshop, our data story workshop, our resonate workshop, and our captivate workshop. These are gonna be available for corporate clients first, but some of them are available to the public right now. We're working just as fast as we can to get them all up online and virtual versions of them. That doesn't just mean someone delivering the in-person workshop over Zoom means we've transformed these to be virtual workshops. And keep an eye out for our newest course, Captivate for Virtual Communicating. We have a Captivate workshop that is designed to help you communicate well in a room. We've transformed that course to be Captivate for Virtual Communicating. And, uh, and it's pretty awesome. I'm pretty excited about that one. Uh, let's see, we've accelerated our timelines in, in an incredible way this last week. And I know I speak for everyone at Duarte when I say how uh, 
excited and moved we are to, to get the opportunity to share them with you. So when that email comes through, check them out. Or if you just can't wait, go to Duarte.com and click through to our training academy. And we would love to have you try those. Uh, with that, we're happy to answer the questions you've been putting in the Q&A box about virtual communication. Here, I'm gonna stop sharing the slides so we can connect with you, just our voices. And uh, you can probably put up a gallery view where you can see all of us. Uh, you're gonna see pictures for our producers, uh, but you're gonna see Nicole and I up there. And uh, let's see, uh, let's take a first. Someone asked, uh, you're both seated. Do you ever consider standing up when you give webinars? I find it measurably helps my voice and energy to stand. We spoke about that a little bit. And as I said, in our studio <laughs> at the office, uh, that's designed for standing. Uh, mm -hmm. It's designed for us to stand up while we're presenting. We decided after evaluating a few things that seated was better. Also, it was better to have us both doing the same thing. Uh, and for both of our apartments, this worked out best. Uh, let's see. How be can mindful. I'm going to add one quick thing to that, Doug. Be mindful when you're standing, folks. If you are standing and you're not grounded and you're swaying on your hips, that's a huge distraction for your audience. So if you're going to stand, that's fine to get your energy out, but make sure from the hip down that you are grounded and solid. Have that energy come from your voice and from your upper body. Great. Here's another question on empathy. Uh, Nicole, maybe you want to take this one. How can I read faces to gauge understanding when I see them all in little tiny boxes? How can mm. I keep, and how can I keep 25 people engaged? I think we'll take the first question from this one. How do I read faces to tell if people are understanding me? Yeah, um, that frankly, that takes practice. <laughs> I would, I would be mindful of using that exclusively as your monitor as to whether or not you're doing well, because sometimes you get people who are smilers and nodders and man those are friendly faces to look at and you just you keep honing in on those people and you might think you're doing great but you might look at someone else and they might have you know this kind of scowl on their face and that might just be their face <laughs> you have to take a consensus and sort of scan there and then if you see something that's off-putting stop talking ask a question if you see confused faces you need to not only be able to read their faces but know what to do with those faces so i'm seeing a couple of confused looks. Let me back up and re-explain that or pause and say, what questions do you have so far? Or I'm seeing nods, which probably means you all get what I'm talking about. Are we ready to move on? Just ask a clarifying question. It's good to look at them and to read them, but don't make assumptions. Definitely use that as an opportunity to create dialogue and see where you need to pivot. That's great. Here's another question. Uh, I was in a streaming class yesterday when a student wanted to ask a question, but their audio was terrible. Do you mm. recommend asking questions via chat? I would say that it's, especially in a teaching situation and especially if your time is limited, chat allows you to scroll through repeat questions and things like that and condense what's in the question so that you can get the most bang for your buck when answering it um, with it, you know, almost 3,000 people on the Zoom today. That's why we're doing it this way. So it, some of you might ask the same question or different variations of the same question. Um, so it saves a lot of time. And when the audio is an issue, when there's a challenge where you, you're not sure if their audio is going to come through okay, chat is great. So yes. Uh, a lot of questions in here about the cameras we're using, the microphones we're using. Uh, I think I addressed that in the webinar. Um, Try out your own. I'm using good old fashioned Apple earbuds. Uh, we decided that of the things I had available, these were the best. Nicole's got some fancy earbuds over there. Um, we're both using pretty, pretty lo-fi cameras, um, mm -hmm. but of the ones, the different tests we ran, these were the best in our apartments for the lighting that we had. Mm -hmm. um, so again, the answer is to test what you have, upgrade a little bit, you know, a Logitech webcam, uh, $100, $200 tops, and it can make a big difference in the quality of your, your video. I will add in one of the emails that you'll all received post webinar, I found a really helpful blog that had reviews on headphones that are best for virtual communication. They're by no means, you know, Duarte endorsed, uh, but I thought it was pretty neutral and pretty helpful. So that's one of the links you'll be receiving if you want more information on that. But yeah, I've been pretty happy with these very generic earbuds to be perfectly honest. And that's, you know, what most people can afford. So if you can afford to upgrade, awesome. If not, this has been working pretty well. So don't feel like you have to go fancy. As long as it works, it works. Yep. 
And, and I'll say another thing, uh, comments about whether we're seated or whether we're standing, uh, questions about our camera and our audio and using the slides, not using the slides, backgrounds, things like that. Who's the final decision maker as to whether, uh, whether it's good enough? Your audience. Mm -hmm. So the point of that presentation isn't for you to look and sound your best. The point of the presentation isn't for you to have a beautiful background behind you. The point of the presentation is to help those people in your audience, to move them from one place to another. So if you're moving them, if it's working, if you're a teacher and the kids are engaging in their learning, then it's working, then you're succeeding. If they're not, then no matter how good your background, how good your camera microphone, you are not succeeding. So that's audience empathy. Tune, tune that dial out toward your audience and make all of your decisions based on whether it's working or not. If it works better for you to wear red because your students seem to engage more when you're wearing red, then wear red and, and have a lower quality camera. That doesn't matter. Invest in more red shirts. Um, <laughs> but the point is that the audience needs to move. It doesn't matter if you look or sound good. That's a different, that's a different bar to hold. Uh, Nic Nicole, I think there's a question that you can handle um, because you dealt with this recently. How do you handle playing videos within a presentation? And I'm going to add to that complicated animations. Mm -hmm. uh, would you leave them out fully when you're virtual? <laughs> I find that it can be very choppy when I broadcast offsite locations. So first of all, kudos to Zoom, who I don't know how they're handling this, but they're pr doing pretty darn well. We know that their capacity has been just overloaded because everybody's communicating virtually. Uh, that being said, they've done pretty well. We use a lot of other platforms too. We happen to be using Zoom today. Um, they're pretty good generally about handling video and, and animation, but with 3,000 people and God knows what else is happening in the interwebs, the second I got our slides back from our designers, which were so beautiful, I said, oh boy, we've got some animation in here in even little ones. Let's eliminate those. Let's set ourselves up for success. Let's do everything we possibly can to eliminate any other tech problems. So when in doubt, no animation, no video, especially if you know that um, your capacity is really high or your participant rate is really high and there are other things going on around you. Awesome. And I'm gonna give this one to Nicole also because it's right in your field. What if we are presenting in a language that is not our native one? Mm -hmm. Articulation is really important. Um, if you have an accent that people aren't familiar with, they have to be able to understand every single syllable. Now, as a speech pathologist, a lot of people have come to me and said, I wanna eliminate my accent, I wanna reduce my accent. Not necessary. As long as we can understand you with an accent, you're fine. So over articulating like I'm doing right now, kind of working hard to form the words, pretending that the audience is hard of hearing and all they have are my lips to read is the cue that I use in my head. But one other one that's really critical is pausing. Your audience needs time to digest something that sounds different from what they're usually used to hearing. Imagine that you had a translator in the room with you. That translator would need an extra beat to absorb what you said think and translate it in their head and then spit it out in the new language. So think of it that way. That pause at first will feel like forever to you. But the trick that I've used is to say to myself, okay, Nicole, pause long enough for them to write it down because they probably are. And even if they're not, that gives me the right amount of time that I should be pausing to give them a chance to absorb it. Uh, here's a question from Nathan. Uh, you may get to it, but how about do's and don'ts for hand gestures? Like the webcam actually has opportunities that you don't have in a live presentation. Like if I move my hands closer, they get bigger. <laughs> <laughs> and I move them far back, they get smaller. So yeah, you want to be careful. You don't want to wig out the audience, as you say in your question. Um, but yes, you can use that. If, if I want to talk about, you know, uh, a certain size thing and I want to show it getting bigger, I can, I can also move my hands in. What I want to be careful of is that I'm familiar and comfortable in doing that, that it doesn't, it doesn't look weird. You know, it's not freaking me out. If I'm watching my video right now, I can do that without my hands going off screen. I know where the edges are and I can make gestures like this and I can be pretty effective at describing things. You know, if I'm talking about, you know, here's, here's where the, uh, the curve is going to be, um, I can talk about it that way. Um, but that does take a little bit of practice. I mentioned puppeteering before, and that this is the muscle you use in, in constantly looking at where the edges of your screen are. 
So you're going to want to practice doing that. Start up a Zoom on your own. Zoom is free for uh, 40 minute meetings or less. You can turn on the Zoom, turn on your camera and record yourself practicing uh, with your gestures to see how, how good you get at it and get better day over day. To that, I would add, because you're on such a small screen, if you have your hands up and you're doing this the entire time, whoa, that's going to be distracting. So as Doug and I have been doing today, make sure you use them and then lose them. Give your audience a break yeah. Yeah. because all, we're very easily distracted, especially virtually when, again, we're competing with our inbox and other things surrounding us. And if that's what you're doing, that's all they're going to focus on. Uh, let's see, would like to understand the rules behind the choices of where you are, covering a third of the screen, coming to chest level, having hands coming to play, um, which is farther back than I've seen others do, but is effective. I think a lot of what you tend to see is from people using laptops, where they're a set distance away from the camera. Laptop cameras, you can't zoom in or out, so you're just how far you are away. So your, your head tends to be much bigger in the camera like that. Um, again, watch TV news anchors. They've been, they've been doing it for 50, 100 years, and you'll watch about how when they, when they crop in, you're going to see about this view. You're going to see, you know, chest level up to the head, and their eyes are going to be, according to that rule of thirds, which says that the, the interesting things should happen along those lines if we put nine boxes on the screen like that. And, you know, my head will be up in this box. My eyes will be right around that line. Uh, and there's all kinds of articles on the internet you could do. Uh, Google rule of thirds, and you'll, you'll see a lot about that. Are Nicole and Doug using a teleprompter? <laughs> no. We're not using a teleprompter. We do have notes in front of us, both. Uh, Zoom actually creates uh, some challenges because you can only project that one, your slides, if you're using slides. So uh, I have a two monitor set up and I'm able to put my speaker notes up near the camera. So if, if I'm looking at speaker notes, glancing at my next line, my eyes are pretty close to the camera. Uh, Nicole, your setup is a little bit different because I'm broadcasting. Yeah, I wasn't able, before we had to mandatorily work from home here in New York, I didn't have time to get another monitor. So I just have my, my MacBook in front of me and I have Zoom on a tiny screen that I've condensed. Next to it, I have um, our other version of PowerPoint um, with our slides and the speaker's notes next to it. And I've just been manually clicking on the slides. So I have it there. I know where Doug is. It's sort of a, a split screen of my own making on, on one laptop. And that's worked just fine. Um, you know, we're, we're a little bit against teleprompters in general because we don't want to read to you. We want, you know, this whole webinar is about connecting with people and having empathy. Reading to them in general, whether in person or virtual, is not the best way to, to make an impression with your audience. So if you have to glance at notes, that's okay, but we like it to be more conversational than presenty or rehearsed because that's just not a great way to make people feel like you're in the room with them. It takes a lot of practice to be able to read from a teleprompter and make it sound live and fresh. That takes mm -hmm. a lot of practice. Um, you see politicians do it. They do it hundreds of times in order to make it sound natural. Most of the folks we work with are experts in some other area. They are not expert speakers. And your best tool, if you're not a professional actor or public speaker, your best tool is authenticity, being yourself. And it's very hard to be yourself if you're reading your notes. So we'll put bullet point notes up. So don't, don't forget to tell them about this. Don't forget to tell them about this. But Nicole and I want to be telling the stories while we're talking to you and, and letting it be fresh and live. Uh, let's see. We had a question about lighting. What are your recommendations for lighting? Mm, good question. And uh, I mean, I can speak to, to my house here. We, we don't have professional lights at home. So I've got a floor lamp right over here. And I've got a, a windows and blinds over there where the morning sun is, is coming through. And uh, after some tests, uh, this place in the apartment and that amount of lighting felt like the right amounts. Nicole, how about yours? Yeah, I don't, I, I don't mind sharing this with you because my lighting is a little funky. I've got my <laughs> lamp right here to my right. I have natural lighting here to my left, and that seemed to be a good balance. 
I added this lamp because so much natural light was coming through that I had a shadow and people couldn't really see my face. So I did close the curtains a bit. I turned off my lights above me. It's just something you have to sort of play around with, but be very mindful of having light behind you and not in front of you. That can make you look like a complete shadow. No one will able, be able to see your facial features. It's better that it comes from in front of you and is shining right on your face like it is with Doug. Yeah, and uh, it's not that sunny of a morning here as it, if it were more sunny, then I would probably end up with a little bit of glare. So um, <laughs> you have to make do with what you can. And like Nicole said, patience and compassion right now are the, the words of the day. So uh, we did our best to, to make our home offices uh, good camera environments. Um, and we knew you would all be forgiving and would understand that we're, we're giving you the best we got. I've got a good question here about empathy. Uh, these tactics are excellent. However, what about clients who need coaching on actually being empathic? Cool. I would forgive less than stellar posture to those who seem genuinely caring about moving an audience. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a great question. And it's one that we can't solve in a webinar, obviously. Yeah. This is something we work on with clients in our one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions. Yeah. Uh, we have tools and techniques. We have journaling exercises. We have, you know, just blunt questions to help people <laughs> get over the hump of, hey, what's happening in your audience is more important than what's, what's happening up here. Mm -hmm. And with every client, it's different of what we have to do to help move them out of that. But it's, it's a longer journey than just a, a webinar or a training uh, can affect. So that's why we have these coaching packages where you're going to work with the same coach over and over again on, on your journey to becoming a more empathetic speaker. For sure. Uh, that's a great question, Cheryl. Thank you. Uh, let me scroll down here. Can you share more about tone and content of conversations in today's virtual empathy environment? Nicole, you got any more mm. thoughts on, on tone? Good quite, tone for women Quite speaking? broad. Read that to me one more time, Doug. I want to make sure I understand yeah. it. Can you share more about tone and content of conversations in today's virtual empathy environment? I'm hearing two different things. When I say tone, I'm referring to the tone of your voice and the quality of the sound when you speak. It sounds like that might be more of a content question, though. When you say tone, you mean the, the, the tone of your word choices, if I'm hopefully interpreting that correctly. So this might be um, a dual answer from both Doug and I, who are both content developers. I think right now it's really important that you have a balance of warmth and strength. We can actually, we, we just created a blog, my coworker Haley and I, around how to have a balance of authority and empathy in times of crisis. We've dealt with a lot of, of clients with, with crisis communication right now. And the trick is to just validate everyone's feelings. People are scared. People are worried. People are trying to manage home life and work life and their kids' school life, and it's really, really challenging. So the first thing to do is, again, be patient, be compassionate, and saying words like, I understand, I'm here for you. I mean, it sounds mushy and it sounds simple, but that goes a long way. And in addition to empathy, having authority so that your, your folks, you know, can, can stick to whatever emergency plan you've created at your company or making sure that they, you know, wash their hands and, and do what you ask them to do to stay healthy. That's also important. But we have found that you are not going to be granted that authority unless you go with empathy first. It's all about making people feel comfortable and making sure that there's a trust there. Then they will trust you to deliver the right information. So um, thank you for asking that. We have a great blog post that we will include in one of our post webinar emails to give you more information on, on how to communicate that way. Awesome. Uh, it's 10.58. I think we're going to stop with that question. And Nicole and I are going to say uh, thank you. We, you made our Fridays. We had a great day uh, talking with you, a great hour talking with you. And we appreciate you lending us your ears and your presence today. And uh, you'll get a link to the recording in the follow-up emails. You'll get some of the resources we talked about. You'll get links for those coaching packages uh, and those other virtual workshops that we talked about. And uh, we hope that you'll check them out. We hope that you'll uh, keep engaging with us here at Duarte uh, because we love helping the world communicate better. We do. Thank you so much, everyone. Stay well, stay healthy, keep working. The train is, is going to get back on the track if, if we have that momentum, all of us together. So stay positive and, and hang in there. All right. Thanks, everybody. And Thank have you. a great day.